just be patient, trust in the process. It's a, it's a lifelong journey. You know, we, we get the sense of accomplishment when we finish that one piece of music, but uh, it never ends. You know, that's the beauty of it. Like you, there's always something to work on. For me, it will take me 10 lifetimes to, to learn everything that I work on, everything that I want to work on. Um, so if you let music be a part of your life, you'll never get bored a day in your life. Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. Ali Omar El Farouk is an Egyptian and Canadian oud and guitar player, composer and teacher. Ali plays his oud and three other instruments during this fascinating conversation in which we talked about learning from a place of joy, connecting across cultures through music, languages, architecture, Istanbul, Spain, Um Kulthum, Nubian music, jazz, and lots more. The link for both the podcast and video version of this episode is in the description, which also brings you to the transcript. Hi, Ali. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Leah. It's a pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. And I was to say good morning. I guess it's still like 8 a.m. in Ottawa right now. That's right. And it's 3.30 in Cairo. Uh, it's three still. Oh, three. Okay. Yeah. So eight hours difference, but uh, I'm used to it. You know, yeah. When I, when I lived in Montreal, there was always a time difference when I had to talk to my family back here. Hmm. I know you listened to Western-influenced music growing up, and you got an interest in the oud and Arabic music when you were older. But when did you actually go to Montreal to study jazz? 2006. Okay. I, uh, well, basically, I, I'm originally an architect. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's like my first bachelor okay. uh, that, I, that I obtained or completed was here in, in Cairo in architectural engineering. I worked for two years following that. And then I was actually... Um, supposed to go do my master's in Germany at the Bauhaus in Dessau. I got, I had got accepted in it, but uh, um, through um, a, uh, like a, a series of, un, of unexpected events, I ended up changing careers and I, I was, initially I wanted to go to the States. Um, I tried to audition for a scholarship at Berkeley College of Music, and there was also the Musicians Institute of Technology in California that I was interested in. But I ended up getting accepted. Like I, I tried, you know, everywhere, and, and I, I, I was researching about universities in Montreal, and uh, I, I applied to both Concordia and McGill universities, uh, and then I got accepted into uh, Concordia University. So this is basically how my life in Canada began, as an international student at Concordia. Okay. Yeah. I- and you started guitar as a teen? Yes. Um, my uh, first guitar was, uh, my father brought me that guitar um, from an antique store here in Cairo, which ironically, it's an, actually an, an, um, an archtop jazz guitar, a Hofner guitar. It's uh, just sitting over there. And it had an unfortunate accident, but I got it in, um, in 1996. So I was 15 years at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, my first instrument actually was piano. Uh, when I was 10 years old, my parents mm-hmm. uh, got me some classical piano lessons. Um, but the teacher was a bit strict, so that didn't encourage me to continue at the time. Um, and then I, guitar, I was curious. Uh, and, and, and at the time, there was um, a couple of my friends were taking uh, guitar lessons with a, with a teacher here in my neighborhood, uh, in Maedi in Cairo. And I tried it out, and then there was just this strong bond that got created, basically, and uh, mm-hmm. the rest was history. I'm curious, you said the teacher was very strict, and was it very, like, straight ahead, you have to do what I say a certain way, everything has to be perfect before you move on type thing? Yes. I mean, I was 10 years old, so what did I know at the time, what I wanted? I mean, I knew I wanted to play the pieces that I that I loved listening to, such mm-hmm. as Furelis and whatever, maybe um, Chopin's uh, or Debussy's uh, Claire de Lune, you know, whatever I, I knew at the time. But he was uh, making me practice all these, um, to me at the time, were obscure pieces. I don't know if they were known, but I didn't know them. And he was quite strict when I made mistakes, you yeah. know. So it was a bit too much for me at the time. <laughs> no, this, this topic comes up often with my guests. I think this is um, a pattern that repeats that a lot of people either teach differently than they learned or they reflect on the first instrument they left behind so I, it sort of fits into this pattern I'm pretty interested in it but yeah I mean you know I love the piano we had a, a grand piano uh, 
which was in this room. This room is now my office where I teach and, and, and practice and do rehearsals. Um, but there was a, a grand piano that was here um, and I just loved sitting on it and just, you know, hearing sounds, uh, just whatever melodies I was able to learn by myself or what I had to practice for my lessons or, and even later with guitar, you know, learning harmony, like basic harmony at the time, chords and melodies, I learned them on guitar, but then I taught myself how to play them on piano from guitar. Okay. So there was always like a back and forth between both instruments, but um, I, I mean, I was, and, I, and for the longest time, I was kind of hesitant whether, which was my favorite instrument, was it the guitar or the piano? You know, and sometimes I think, oh, maybe that teacher ruined my career as a pianist, you know. <laughs> but I believe also everything happens for a reason, you know. Mm -hmm. So I have basic piano skills and I can teach, like, you know, piano to beginner levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but the guitar, you know, I never stopped playing since then. So, yeah. When you compose, is it always at the guitar or sometimes at the piano? Um, it's not, there's no rule really for me. Um, and... I haven't done as much composing as I want to, mm -hmm. so um, I mean, it's definitely will be more on guitar than piano because, like, we don't have that piano anymore. It it belonged to my my late grandmother at the time, and she gave it to my uh, my uncle, um, and I don't have one now. Um, I have a keyboard, you know, but eventually I'd like to get uh, an acoustic piano, or maybe electric piano, or you know, an upright acoustic. So I don't have one, but I mean. Um, if I'm just playing on playing guitar uh, and something comes up, then I would maybe record that and, and go back later to rec to work on it. But I've also uh, you know composed music that I ended up playing on the oud, and the melodies. The first initial idea would come up while I'm playing the oud, but then when I would go back later to work on it and develop it into a complete piece of music, at the time I was. I knew that I, I wanted, you know, to have melody and harmony because um, I had um, an upright bass player in my, my trio at the time. So I would have to try out, you know, how they work together on the piano just to hear, you know, uh, multiple voices moving together. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would always sit at the, at the piano and, and, and try out different ideas. So um, it depends on the situation, but uh, I guess it's a, it's a mix of, of all three instruments, I guess. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the oud, and I know you're happy to share some music with us today. Um, some people won't know what an oud is. And for people listening uh, who can't see the video, can you describe how it's different than a guitar? Um, absolutely. It does bear some uh, res uh, similarities, but um, the main difference uh, being that it does not have frets. It's a stringed instrument, just like the guitar, and it, you know, the same concept where if you're right-handed, the right hand plucks and the left hand uh, frets the neck to change pitch um, according to the note that you want to play. Um, but unlike the guitar, the oud is fretless, um, just like with violin, cello, viola, upright bass, and other fretless instruments. And um, in addition to the Western music scales and modes that, you know, people from the West are familiar with. There's also a whole world of um, modes that are famous in the Middle East and the Arab world, which um, some of them are semitonal, just like Western scales and modes, but some of them have microtonal intervals. And these intervals you cannot play on a standard fretted guitar. So it allows you to play uh, these other types of scales and modes, basically. And um, I mean, obviously, the, the construction is different in the sense like the guitar has back and sides where the oud has a bowl. Um, and the guitar has six single strings. The ouds are mainly six double courses. Um, this one has seven courses because like, it has a bigger range, but most ouds you will see will have six courses. And then the neck is smaller. So on your typical classical guitar, the neck joins the body at the 12th fret. So you have 12 semitones that you can play up until the neck joins the body. Whereas the oud, it's actually as if you're going up seven semitones. Mm. So it's a, smaller, uh, it's a smaller neck, but I think each instrument presents its own set of challenges. Yeah. Um, also the technique is different as far as, I mean, the left hand, obviously you have things like, uh, you know, the glissando, which maybe is easier to do on a fretless instrument, you know. Mm. 
Um, so it's very expressive in that sense. Um, and also, you, oud players, they use a, a type of plectrum, which is elongated, such as this one. They're made of different types of materials, but this is usually the sound. You, you can't get it without playing with, with this, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, do you want to play something for us since you have your instrument out? Sure. I mean, since I have the oud, maybe I could start with that. Um, I maybe I'll. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to maybe play on the oud. Um, one is a, is a piece of music that I composed when I was in Spain earlier this year. But maybe I would start with um, just to, to kind of, if anyone who's not familiar with the oud or with with this type of music, um, I'll do a type of improvisation. Uh, which is um, it's it's called takasim in Arabic, which means divisions, uh, and it's called that because it deals with dividing the scale or the mode. So um, th there's um, an order or logic to it, uh, which is different from just any uh, typical uh, improvisation. So in, in takasim, you're basically you're taking the listener on a on a journey or a voyage across the mode that you're improvising on. It starts with the lower register and then it moves to the middle area of the mode and then the climax is like the higher register of the mode. Um, and then you take them on a journey back home, if you will. So. <laughs>
right. Hopefully that gave some people a taste of uh, this type of improvisation. It was so beautiful, thank you. Oh, a pleasure. Hi, just a quick break from the episode. I'm an independent podcaster who does all the many jobs required to produce the series, and there are a lot of costs I bear as well. Please consider either buying me a virtual coffee as a tip or becoming a monthly supporter starting at $3 Canadian, which is close to $2 US or 2 euros, and getting access to unique perks. The link is in the description. Now back to the episode. The next piece of music is one that I composed in the month of May of this year. I gave myself the uh, entire month of May to go to the city of Sevilla in Andalucía, in the south of Spain. Um, it was my first time to ever visit Spain, um, and I went there for several different reasons. Uh, but one of my main purposes of spending the entire month of May in Sevilla was to go and study flamenco music at uh, one of the best uh, flamenco music schools in Spain called Artes Escenicas Rebollar, which was founded by Eduardo Rebollar, a great flamenco guitarist and musician and great human being. Uh, he founded it 10 years ago. Um, so I flew to Sevilla directly from Istanbul, uh, where I spent the most of the month of April uh, in Istanbul. And uh, I went to get this lovely oud uh, from uh, a great oud maker in Istanbul called Jangi Sarakush. Um, so I took the oud with me from Turkey to Spain. Um, but since I arrived to Spain, um, it might, since I had a very limited time there and I was there on a main purpose to, to just immerse myself completely into flamenco music, um, I barely touched the oud during most of my, my time uh, in, in Sevilla in the month of May. Um, the, the, the school where I was studying was full-time classes, seven hours of classes per day, plus all the hours of practice, plus, plus, plus. And I was exploring Spain and visiting different cities every weekend. Um, so I was approaching the end of my time there, and that's when I realized maybe I should, you know, just take the oath to the school and show it to people there, just to see what might happen, what might come out of it. Um, because otherwise I was just one of many other guitar players there to, to study flamenco music, right? So uh, on the first day of my last week there, uh, on Monday, on Monday I, I just went into the school with the oud and my guitar, um, and one of the music, uh, one of the guitar teachers at the school called Pedro Ramirez, great guitar player and human being, he had this project where he was recording compositions by other guitarists at the school. And one thing led to another, I ended up recording some oud to improvise on the ending of one of the, the, the songs or the pieces by one of the other guitar players. So it was great uh, experience, all in all, I loved it and um, I recorded it at the studio there of the school. After we were done, Pedro told me, if you want, you know, I can also record your own composition here at the school studio. And so I told him, but I'm leaving in a week. Um, that's it. I'm leaving at the end of May. I was going to go to Madrid, uh, where I was going, where I stayed for 11 days, and then I, and that was it. And then I came back to Cairo. So I told him, I only have one week left, so he told me, well, you better hurry up. Um, because I didn't have anything to record. I hadn't written any kind of music uh, in four years since I released my album in Montreal in 2019. Um, and, you know, I'm there to study flamenco music, so I hadn't composed any music for flamenco or in the style of flamenco music which is known to be played traditionally in one of uh, many different forms. Uh, I hadn't composed anything, so... Um, and I had a week left. And from that week, um, I took two days off to go and visit the city of Granada, to visit Alhambra. Uh, so basically, I only had five days to come up with something to record at the school studio. That piece of music 
Um, I recorded it as a dialogue between the oud and the flamenco guitar. And I recorded it in one of my favorite uh, music forms in flamenco music known as the tangos. Um, and so that's it. Like the whole thing from start to finish was recorded in five days. And I called it Nostalgia Esperanzadora, which is Spanish for hopeful nostalgia. I'm not so good on, on picking names for my compositions and I might choose to change the name in the future, but this is what I came up with for this piece of music. So um, ideally, I envision this piece to have oud, flamenco guitar, palmas, which is you know the clapping that gives the rhythm. As well, I, I would probably want to add electric bass and percussion such as cajon, but for the sake of recording the song at the school studio, I recorded a demo just to present to Pedro to show him the, the vision of what I would like to do. And then I went to the school studio and I re-recorded the oud parts. And Pedro is supposed to re-record re the guitar parts himself because he's a fantastic flamenco guitar player. I'm still waiting to hear from him. But in the meantime, uh, what I'm going to play right now is myself performing the song, um, playing along with the demo recording that I recorded when I was in Sevilla. So maybe one day I can perform it with a full band. That's kind of my goal, actually, like for the future. I want to write music for oud and flamenco guitar, and you know, in, in different flamenco music forms. Uh, so I. You know, I consider this song or this piece of music as the first step towards going uh, in that direction, hopefully, in a non too distant future. So here it is, Nostalgia, Esperanza Dora. Hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. 
So something to maybe start warming up with. Um, over the past few years, I've been doing sort of my own guitar, solo guitar arrangements of um, well-known Egyptian songs. Some of them are sort of more traditional, some more contemporary, but they've been just coming out, you know, over the years. And um, I feel like I, this is a last, the latest guitar I got. It's a nice flamenco guitar, and uh, I feel like I tried these songs over, you know, electric, uh, classical, but um, lately with this guitar, I feel like they sound the best. I, because I had this concert last month um, here in Cairo, which was a collaboration with uh, with this wonderful flamenco group that came from Spain, from Sevilla. Um, so I, I played some pieces with them and I played some pieces solo. So this is one of the solo pieces that I played. And this is basically a medley of three Egyptian songs that I kind of play one after another. So this is not flamenco music. This is Egyptian music, kind of, maybe with a flamenco flavor, I guess.
Fantastic, thanks so much. Thank you for listening. When you played the oud, is vibrato traditional or is that something that's got added more recently? It is traditional. It's part of um, your articulation or, or form of expression on the instrument. Um, it also should be used kind of a bit um, more intentionally or judiciously. Like it's not a, a technique that should be used all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, Especially uh, if I'm practicing a scale, or even if I'm teaching somebody a scale, um, I would ask them to play it without any vibrato at the beginning, because one of the biggest challenges about learning the oud, because you don't have frets, so your fingers are the frets. So mm -hmm. to get proper intonation, um, you need to really make sure every note is in tune without having to mask it behind a vibrato. So some people resort to vibrato kind of just a, as a... As a I don't know how to put it, but as a way to try and sound good, but one should not depend on it. So for example, if I'm just playing like a major scale. You know, but then I can, if I'm doing something. should be able to play without it. Ultimately, it ends up becoming kind of like a subconscious um, articulation tool as an oud player. So you'll hear this or, you know, any oud player will probably do stuff like... And then you have slow vibrato and fire fast to run ones, so... Or... I think it's one of many tools, just like, I mean, there's um, the tremolo technique also. You know. you know, but also it's one of those techniques that, you know, you don't want to overuse it because then it, it loses its um, value or its effect, I guess. Mm -hmm. And the, the plectrum you use, what's the word you use for it? The reesh? Uh, there's the word risha, which is mm -hmm. Arabic word for feather, um, because in the uh, more ancient times or older days, actually they they use an actual either's uh, eagle's feather, or quail, you know, uh, and they would treat it in a, in oil just for it to be more flexible. Those are very hard to come by now, so you know the the, the most common, the used or easier to find one is made of plastic, um, but 
The best, better material is either made of ox horn, and these are the ones that I used most, like for most of my life. Uh, most recently, the wood maker who made me this, Jangi Sarakush, great wood maker in Istanbul, he made me uh, one made of out of tortoise shell. Oh, okay. you can believe it, yeah. And I just love the sound of it. It's just, it just sounds great. It, you know, I because also the different wood players they, have, they develop different techniques and they use rishas with different uh, levels of. Um, flexibility so some of them they really use ones that are very flexible I can't use those I really need something a bit hard just I'm used to having um, something to give me um, a re like a resistance you yeah. know so but also not too much I like this one so much actually because I was there for like almost a month and I was visiting all like the best oud makers in, in Istanbul and I went I, I asked him if he like the wood maker who made me this one Jangi Sarakush I asked him if he could make me another one he was too busy so I went to another one and I, and I asked him if he could make me two more and I asked him to make maybe one same thickness as this one and another one a bit thicker but the other one that was thicker ended up being just too much so just on my very like the last day before I left I went back to him and I asked him to sand it off to make it a little bit more flexible so it's, it's trial and error for me, really. Um, but I, I, right now, this is kind of this degree of flexibility is, is what I like the most. So mostly plastic, uh, ox horn, or tortoise shell. And tortoise shell actually is also material used uh, to play um, other Middle Eastern instruments. There's the kanun, which you may have heard of. It's the kind of like a seated instrument with 47 strings, and they put the plectrums on their fingers. I think usually the index. Maybe the, maybe the middle one. There's also, they're also made out of tortoise shell, but they're different size and they're made to kind of get attached to the finger. There's also the Tur Turkish balama, which um, it has a smaller bowl but an elongated neck. And that was interesting because it's fretted, but it has a quarter tone intervallic frets. Okay. So it also uses a, a plectrum or risha similar to this one, but a smaller one. But for me, I'm used to, I developed the technique with, with the oud risha, so when I play it, I play with the oud risha. There's also the name Mizrab, or Mizrab, which is another word for, for plectrum. It's, a, it's such a long, it looks sort of like, more like a nail file, like it's quite long compared to a, a guitar pick. And then you use your nails yeah. when you play classical and flamenco. So do you find it hard to adjust between the different techniques? Uh, each technique requires practice. Yeah. It's, it's required. Yeah, there's no, you know, even because I got into classical guitar for a couple of years and before getting more into flamenco, and even that adjustment, it, it took, took practice. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess there's kind of like a mode in my head that I make a switch, you know, if I'm playing, I mean, playing oud, there's no way other than this is the main technique. Sometimes I use my thumb if I want to like play a drone on the you know, the, the lower Bass. chorus, I might just like do something. Or, but, but mainly it's played with, with the plectrum, with the risha. Um, you know, there's some instances where you can play some chords, but I mean, though it is not really made uh, to be a chordal instrument, but you can do something like... And I've also experimented with Playing some finger style on the oud, you know, like uh, so to a certain degree, you can kind of play with the same techniques that you use on guitar, but ultimately, I mean, you need this. <laughs> mm -hmm. For guitar, I mean, yeah, classical, we all know the techniques, and, and flamenco also has its own thing, so, um, yeah, I just, I switch modes from mm -hmm. one instrument to another. You had mentioned that when you're in Sevilla, you took a couple of days to go to Granada, and um, the Alhambra Palace, I imagine. Yes. Yes, every weekend was, was a different city, but Granada was incredible. Yeah, my very first trip to Europe, I was I played there actually with a an orchestra, wow. and it was um, very. I think it was one of the first things I'd seen of that beauty. It was really striking. Do, can you? I mean, you you have a background in architecture. Can you talk about it a little bit? 
Sure. I mean, I'm also, yeah, uh, how I began in architecture, I mean, I'm fortunate that my father is a renowned architect in, in the Arab world. Um, he, uh, he was mentored by a very famous Egyptian architect called Hassan Fathi, who was known for uh, being a pioneer in vernacular architecture and more um, environmentally friendly architecture. His designs rarely had any flat roof, so they mostly incorporated domes and vaults, which, um, because you know Egypt is a, is a hot country, so you try to reduce uh, the hot temperature inside the building for as long as possible. And so you have, you know, when the sun is, is rotating throughout the whole day from east to west, the angle in which the sun is projected over the roof changes. So if you have a flat ceiling, then the, the sunlight and, the, te- and the, the temperature is is divided over the entire roof throughout the whole day. But with, with a curved ceiling, like a vault or a dome, it is only one portion of the roof that has the sun directed on it and also creates air movements. Um, and so uh, my father kind of you know, he continued in that direction and he pioneered as a, as a specialized architect in Islamic architecture. So he's designed and built mosques in several countries in the Middle East, so including Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. Um, and so I was just very exposed to this style of architecture. Um, and even when we would visit, there's, you know, for any tourist who would come to Cairo, it's really worth visiting the... Um, what we call Islamic Cairo, just because it's like that part of the history of Egypt where there's old Arabic houses that were built and designed with, uh, with this approach and this philosophy in mind. Um, what I love about it is that it's um, the design of the house or the mosque or whatever the building is, is very functional. So, the, you know, whoever's designing it, um, they think about each space and how it functions and how they're connected to each other, circulation. Uh, and in the end, it's using pure geometrical forms. Um, so even like if you see a minaret of a mosque, you know, it has a, a cylindrical you know, cross section that kind of goes on top of an octagon and then this goes on top of a, of a square. So. Um, For me, I just, uh, all these geometrical forms uh, are very relaxing psychologically, but at the same time, it's not symmetrical. Like if you look at at any of the elevations of uh, one of these houses or mosques on the outside, it's not made to look symmetrical. It just, you know, whatever the function is. Um, So I was very exposed and enriched by this style of architecture growing up, even if I've left it for music, but I still definitely appreciate it very much. So, you know, and, and before going to, to Spain, I, I learned a lot about the history of the south of Spain, which is where flamenco music evolved from, uh, and Dalatia, um, and, uh, no, you know, studied the, the history of this part of Spain where the Moors ruled for eight centuries, and uh, I've seen pictures, but it was nothing like when I went there and visited these places. So Sevilla was my base for May, but I, I, for um, over three weekends, I went to three different cities. The first one, I went to Jerez, and the second one was Cordoba, and the third one was Granada. But, so each one of these cities, I went to targeting one of these famous monument historical buildings. And um, visiting these buildings was just incredible absolutely mind-blowing it's uh, i'm so glad that they were not destroyed and they, you know even you know if, if uh, the spanish inquisition like they you know, took over but but they like the the mesquite cathedral of cordoba was just uh, it was very um, incredible experience being in a building that's at the same time a mosque and a church um, but just that style of architecture it's you know the for me this is islamic architecture at, at the height of its glory um, it's incredible. And, and Alhambra, I was there for five hours and I would have stayed another two hours uh, except I had to catch the, my bus back to Sevilla. But uh, the landscaping there is just incredible. And um, this was supposed to be like, you know, the Moors at the time, they, they envisioned what paradise was. 
and that's mm. how they try to replicate you know this is heaven on earth in you know uh, manifested in in the alhambra so uh and it's not just the buildings honestly the whole the whole city whether it was sevilla jerez cordoba or granada uh, each city had its own very unique charm and i loved just getting lost in the city and i loved these very narrow alleyways that always were zigzagging at angles and you don't know where it's going to lead next and there were, there's just this, this, this very uh, special and unique vibe that I, I just absolutely loved. And it's very different. I mean, I didn't go to the north of Spain. The northern I was was Madrid, which is, somewhere, which is somewhere in the middle. And Madrid has its own vibe as well, which I absolutely loved. But the south is really, um, it's very special. Mm -hmm. Did um, you learn Spanish a little bit before you went, or how did that work See, sí, un you? poquito. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spent, uh, I mean... You know, there's all these online platforms such as Duolingo. I went with one called Babbel, and I was learning as much as I can, both Turkish and Spanish. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Spanish ended up being easier for me because I speak English, French, and French, and so, you know, they're Latin-based just like Spanish is. And I, the more I learned about Spanish, I found uh, more similarities with French. Um, and, I mean... My Spanish is still uh, muy pobre, quite poor, but I, I, during that, I was in Spain for almost like a month and a half in total, uh, but during that time, I started being able to kind of, you know, speak some basic stuff, you know. I, I, I understand maybe a bit more than I can speak, um, and, you know, it's fragments, but uh, but it's it's an easy language if you really work on it, which... I want to, and I tend to work on it for, for the years to come. But being there definitely, um, I mean, first of all, thank God for Google Translate. Um, but but um, just, you know, sometimes you have no choice because the person you're trying to converse with, they don't speak uh, English. So you have to force yourself. Um, I, I talked a bit earlier about Pedro, that guitar player, who um, kind of pushed me to write this composition. The ironic thing is, that's cool, um, it has um, three guitar teachers, plus Eduardo, who's like the school director. But out of the three guitar teachers, he's the one who doesn't speak English. But ironically for me, he's the one that I felt I connected with the most. I mean, I loved them all, but, but he, Pedro especially, he's, he was, he's such an, uh, uh, um, a generous uh, person. Like he was just sharing everything he knows. And even though, you know, there's a bit of a communication barrier there because, you know, it doesn't speak, it speaks like almost no English and I speak very bad Spanish, but I went to him for a private lesson other than these classes. So, um, and the same thing happened to me in Turkey, even Turkish was even harder for me to, to communicate with than Spanish. But in spite of the linguistic barrier, I still felt like I connected very well with with people there. You know, I, I formed friendships with people. Uh, there's one even in Madrid. There's a fantastic musician called Sebastian Vita. He's mainly a trumpet player, but he's one of those multi instrumentalists. I went to his jam sessions, and we became like brothers. Even though I have a hard time talking to him, you know, but for me that's just incredible. You know, it's just language is only a barrier, that, and and we're not limited by it. You know. Yeah. And certainly you, you continue to use music as a connector across cultures. It's the international language. Yeah. yeah. Your, your bass player friend, uh, Mike Damasi, so you brought him to Egypt early on before you even formed the trio with him. Yes. Um, I've kind of, I mean, between, I, that happened in 2013 where I bought Mike and uh, my good friend Thomas Durant, a great jazz drummer as well. I brought them to Cairo. Um, so between 2006 and 2013, uh, that idea came to me from a, a good friend of mine. He's originally from Alexandria, from Egypt, but he's, he moved uh, to Canada a long time ago before I was even born. His name is Freddie Rizk, and uh, he's a wonderful jazz guitar player. And he had brought a band from Montreal to Egypt. And even at the time, he did a tour here in the Middle East between Egypt Jordan and Syria um, and so he gave me that idea uh, 
which was kind of like a dream of mine to want to kind of unify my two worlds that are so far apart. Um, and so the, the idea of bringing this band here, uh, it basically it was born out of a conversation that I had with Thomas and um, another friend of his, a fantastic bass player called Kyle Morin. And they're completely fascinated with pharaonic history and architecture and, and, and culture. And we were just talking about it. And, and then I, I asked them, guys, do you want to come to Egypt? And they're like, of course, we'd love to. You know, they never dreamt of it. Um, Kyle couldn't make it because he had other, uh, another tour he had to go on. And, you know, I, was, I, I, I had known about Mike at the time. You know, he came to, uh, to play uh, at Concordia when I was there at the time. And, uh, you know, I got to know him through the, the Montreal jazz scene because, I mean, he's, he's a musical genius who played with all my teachers, you know, even though he's younger than me. Um, and there's uh, a music festival here that, that I thought might be a good opportunity for us to come and play at. And so what ended up happening, um, through a very long and arduous process, I, I basically I went to the Egyptian consulate at the time, I introduced myself to the Egyptian consul at the time, uh, Amin Meleka, um, and I, I presented the idea to him, and he was very uh, kind enough to work with me over like the months that followed. Um, he, he made it as a collaboration between Egypt and Quebec. He put me in touch with... Um, a lady called uh, Melanie Chartrand, and she was like uh, working with um, the the middle, like they're called the um, uh, the Ministry of International Relations, and they were dealing with the Middle Eastern kind of branch, and so they basically they gave me the funding to which it honestly it covered um, just about most of our flight tick our of our flight tickets. I had to pay a bit uh, to cover a bit of it. Um, and um, what happened was that I, I just didn't want to come and just play like a typical jazz kind of uh, concert. I wanted something that kind of also was related to Egyptian music. So at the time, um, one of two oud players who influenced me greatly to learn the oud, uh, his name was Hamza Eldin, and he was a very uh, very unique artist who uh, he was born and raised in, in the south of Egypt. There's a very old culture, uh, which is now in, is where the, the south of Egypt and north of Sudan is called the Nubian culture. So he comes from Nubia, which um, is a very ancient culture that exists even since the time of the pharaohs. They have their own language, which is learned orally. It doesn't even have an alphabet, which on, they only introduced that recently. But Hamza al-Din... Um, he grew up in Egypt, um, but then he emigrated to the States and he was teaching ethnomusicology in, in, in, uh, in a in university in California and he's recorded like several albums and, and his music is a very interesting fusion because Nubian music is mainly, um, just like other African types of music, is mainly uses pentatonic scales. But he came to Cairo and he had learned the oud and learned all those Arabic music maqams or modes that have these microtonal intervals. So he was, he, his music is basically a fusion between Nubian music and, and Arabic music, uh, in a sense. And so I did basically my own tribute to his music and the music of Nubia, uh, where I, I, you know, I took some of his songs that I loved playing on the oud, but I rearranged them in a way that um, allowed for more improvisation. So I would sort of add sections where there could be either guitar oud solo or upright bass solo or even a drum solo. So what ended up happening, and also at the time, um, I got introduced to Hamza Adin's nephew, who's a wonderful singer here called Karam Murad, and he sings, you know, Nubi because also Nubian music, they have their whole music uh, repertoire of songs, which is also learned between them. So his nephew knows a lot of these songs, and he knows his uncle's songs as well. And so what ended up happening, I, I basically, I brought Thomas and Mike uh, from Montreal, like we came together. And before coming, we were, I was in communication with, uh, with Karam Murad, Hamzadi's nephew, uh, just to discuss what songs we're going to play and, uh, and the arrangements. And that's also for me was one of the, you know, the magic of music where he doesn't speak English and they don't speak Arabic. And 
we, like we had one rehearsal where we played all these arrangements that I had already worked with them before and we just had this one rehearsal and we played this concert together. It was mainly me with them as a trio and then we invited him to play uh, like the second half of the concert with us. So it was a wonderful experience where I kind of played music that I loved and was influenced by at the time. And I got even some wonderful feedback from people who are of Nubian origins. Because, the, you know, people of, of Nubian origins, even though it's mainly the south of Egypt, and, uh, but a lot of them, they, you know, they moved to Cairo. Some of them don't even speak Nubian anymore because they, lived, they grew up here, you know. But they appreciate the fact that I was playing their, uh, their music. So um, it was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And so Nubian isn't related to Arabic as a language? No, it's not. It's a completely different uh, language. And even so, you know, the songs of Hamza Din that I was learning, some of them he sings in Arabic and some of them he sings in Nubian. And I was, when I was talking to Karam at the time, I asked him if I could, like, can I learn Nubian? He told me the only way for you to do that, you would have to go and, and, and live in Nubia for seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. So I asked him to translate the lyrics for me. I mean, I was just, you know, singing them just phonetically, you know, I, I wrote them using Arabic alphabet, but just, you know, kind of transliterated from what the sounds are. But yeah, it's a completely different language. Mm -hmm. And in terms of Arabic music, um, Um Kaltoun, am I saying her name correctly? Mm. Um Kalthoun. Um Kalthoun. Yes. So I was curious because when we'd spoken before, you mentioned uh, what her repertoire was such an influence on you learning it. And I was so amazed to learn that she had had this radio broadcast for what was it, 40 years or 30 years, every day at the same time? I don't know, was it every day or every week? Oh, I don't know the frequency, but I know that everyone across the Middle East... Oh, monthly. Okay, almost, I just looked at... Yeah, yeah I took my notes. <laughs> monthly concerts on Radio Cairo for 40 years, and that apparently all the traffic would stop because everyone would go home to listen to her. Yeah. she. I mean, she had the longest career ever ago. You know, she was blessed with that, but I mean, she was also had incredible vocal range. Um... But, I mean, she left behind it in an immense body of work. If you go on her Wikipedia page and just, there's one page for just all her works, it's impossible for anybody to learn all her, all her music because uh, it's, it's five decades of, you know, music, of creation. Um, she, she, was, she had an incredible voice uh, and, and a lot of singers. You know, just like we have the voice... You know, in the West, there's like the Middle Eastern version of the voice, or we call Arabs Got Talent. And a lot of these female singers, they go and they sing some of her songs just to kind of show how they're good as singers. So she's like the, the, the standard in Arabic music, just like Ella Fitzgerald is in jazz. You know, just like a, a jazz singer would transcribe Ella's solo on, on a jazz standard. Same thing for Umm Kalthum in, in Arabic music. Uh, she uh, also... She developed her own f successful formula because she also came from a very, you know, simple and traditional background. She, she grew up in, in sort of like a rural area in Egypt. Eventually, she moved to Egypt, to, to Cairo, sorry, because this is where their big music uh, industry is always. Um, but when she first moved to Cairo, she moved with her father, who was... Um, you know, he's given the, the title of Sheikh, not necessarily because he, like, you know... Um, goes to a mosque, but they, they sing these kind of uh, religious chants or verses. Um, and it's basically, and, and, and the way they did it first was, it's all a cappella. He's singing and he had basically his children who were kind of, kind of singing as a background to him. But he quickly found that she outshone all of her siblings and she had something special. And so... The other uh, composers, famous composers at the time, they noticed her talent and they strongly encouraged him to bring her to Cairo. And this is how her career in Cairo started. And even at the time, he made her dress as a boy because, you know, they're traditional back then. And I mean, this is what, in the 30s, maybe, you know. Uh, so this is almost 100 years ago. Uh, but, you know, eventually she started, you know, uh, making her own thing and... Uh, over the course of her career, she developed this, this formula where she, her contribution to the song was her voice, but she would work with a poet who would write the lyrics and the composer who would write the music for it. So there's always this triangle, the voice, 
the lyrics and the music. And then the composer, who uh, um, coincidentally enough, all the composers are oud players. Uh, not, not all of them are necessarily, you know, dedicated, you know, oud performers, but they always use the oud to compose the music. Uh, but then they would re rearrange the music for her orchestra, which included you know, like a whole violin section, cello, upright bass, kanun. Uh, there was a oud player who was always in her ensemble, even if he wasn't the composer of all the songs, until he passed away and she couldn't get anyone after him. But there was always you know, this kind of instrumentation, and of course the percussion. And then one of the famous composers eventually, um, he, was, he succeeded in, in adding the electric guitar. There was a, a famous guitar player who played the Fender Stratocaster, and he made that work with all the other instruments, which is not very traditional, but he made it work. So that was her, her and her orchestra uh, that was performing, you know, her, her greatest known works for most for her career her whole career until she passed away in the 70s and um one thing i also noticed before because you know i, I it, her music is not easy to digest if you're not into arabic music or you know even if you speak if you come from the arab world it's not easy always to kind of um be a, an aficionado of her songs just to start with um, some songs are easier to listen to than others. For me, it's after I started playing the oud and studying those modes that I really got into her music and I started listening to, to all the, her songs on a more uh, active level because the, the modes, they keep changing from one section to another. And then I had this ensemble in Montreal at the time where we play her music and so I would learn her songs. And her songs, they were like an entire suite, the whole song. People, you know, say her concerts last for a long time, over an hour. But that's not really accurate because I always refer to the studio recording of the piece, which she did before playing it live and touring with it. And it always had an average length of 30 minutes. And it was composed of three, of like usually around three separate uh, sections. But there's always like the chorus that repeats at the end of each section. You know, they go back to that. And so... Um, she, this was her formula with, you know, each composer would write a, a new song for her, which, but it's, we're talking about a 30 minute piece of music. And uh, it, she just, you know, exploded over the whole Arab world and she toured everywhere. You know, she went to Morocco, she went to Tunisia, to Iraq. Uh, I think she went to Algeria, if I'm not mistaken. She even went to Paris. So you can't, you know, play Arabic music and not know her songs, you know. Mm -hmm. So growing up, you weren't really listening to Arabic music. And what I find interesting is it's when you were in Montreal that you really got deeply into it with that community there. Yeah, I do things uh, <laughs> vice versa, like the opposite. I, it just, this is kind of how my, uh, my path went. I, I grew up in a quite a Western influenced society here in Cairo. So, you know, first instrument, piano, and then the guitar. Um, and I was like... I took some guitar lessons with um, with a teacher here when I first started in 96, but for the 10 years that followed between 96 and 2006 when I moved to Montreal, but in those 10 years I was mainly self-taught. Uh, and I was playing different venues here, uh, but it was mainly playing you know, rock music, anything from what was coming out at the time to a, a big portion I was playing progressive rock, classic rock, you know, Pink Floyd, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin. Uh, mm -hmm. Camel, um, all this stuff. Um, and then when I w got really curious about jazz music and I got into it, that's when I kind of had a shift. But I, I also, I don't come from a music fa musical family, um, with the exception of my grandmother who played the classical piano and even like, she played it at home more. I didn't come from a family that uh, listened to a lot of Arabic music. So I didn't have the biggest exposure to it growing up here. Um, then I moved to Montreal in 2006 to uh, do my, my first bachelor uh, um, or music diploma at Concordia University. Um, and after I graduated from Concordia in 2009, I had a bit of an identity crisis. Uh, you know, who am I? And also, I mean, I loved the Oud all my life and I was listening to these recordings by Hamza al Deed. and also another huge influence for me was Anwar Brahim, who's a fantastic uh, Tunisian Oud player. Um, 
so I love the oud in general, um, but I never got the chance to learn it until uh, on one of my trips back to Cairo. Uh, I was just here on for, for a few months uh, in two, between 2010 and 2011. It was supposed to be maybe a three-month trip, but then we had the first wave of the Egyptian Revolution that took place in uh, January 2011, and so I, it ended up being a six-month trip. But on, on that trip, I bought my first oud and started taking some lessons with, with an oud player here. And then I went to Montreal, and that's when I started um, uh, like seeking out other musicians. Because Montreal, the, the, the, the great thing about it is that it has all these different music scenes. There's jazz music scene, there's Arabic or Middle Eastern, flamenco, classical, you know. Um, so I started meeting musicians who come from different countries in the Arab world, and now I have friends who come from, you know, Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and, and it's incredible. And I ended up, over the years that followed, I would always play at the Festival du Monde Arabe de Montréal, which takes place every November in Montreal. Um, and uh, also, it's not just that, the, that whole world of music, the, the, that way of improvising in, in, in this music world, it, it kind of touched uh, very deep for me. And, um, and eventually, I, I, I also listened to, I mean, coming into the Oud, I came from a very untraditional beginning, because it was like Hamza al Din and Anwar Brahim, their, their music, are not traditional at all. They're like fusions. Anwar Brahm especially because he, uh, his music is a mixture of oud and other Western instruments. He would record each album with different instruments, but he plays with piano, accordion, you know, electric bass, clarinet, saxophone. Um, so you'd hardly hear um, quarter tone intervals in, in his songs, but maybe because of it's all semitonal, that's why I connected with it very easily. Mm. Um, but for me to, to really go deeper into, into the oud, uh, I, I had to go back to the more traditional stuff. And that's when I discovered there's uh, the Arab Music Retreat that takes place every summer in uh, Massachusetts. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it was founded by Simon Shaheen, who's an incredible uh, American-Palestinian uh, musician. He's like a violin and oud virtuoso. And he, he established that retreat uh, 20 years ago. Um, and it's one week of intensive classes of Arabic music. You go and you specialize in one of the main instruments. And I went twice. So the first time I went was in 2014, and, and that gave me a, a big push. And, and then, you know, I, you know, coming at it, I was already at a professional level as a musician and a guitar player, so I knew what I had to work on. Mm -hmm. And um, th it was a journey of, of uh, learning, like, all these modes, the maqams, it was for me. It was such an enjoy, enjoyable journey, exploring them, and always comparing them to the Western music modes, which I have a good, you know, knowledge of. So um, there was always a parallel, you know. Um, and so I loved, I loved this kind of all these parallels between both uh, worlds. Mm -hmm. Just to circle back briefly, so when you went back to Cairo in 2010, I mean that must have been really terrifying. It was ext the very violent, lots of... Um, I mean, at the time, yeah, it was... There, was, there were 18 days of protests. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very... Um, I wouldn't... I mean... Terrifying might not be like the, my first uh, word of choice because... I mean, we, we, there's definitely a, a great uncertainty to what the future is going to hold because... Uh, nobody knew how long these protests were going to last. Um, I went once, and I would have liked to have gone more. I went a bit more the second time, a mm -hmm. couple of years later in the second wave. But the first time, um, it was just uh, the, the way things happened, they happened very quickly. I, I remember I was, uh, I was teaching here. Every time I come here for like several months, I would teach you know, guitar lessons, uh, private lessons, and I remember one of my students told me there's a peaceful protest that are going to happen. Uh, they're marching to the to downtown Cairo, and um, I had gotten a Facebook invite to to an event that was, uh, you know, it was it was scheduled on ja and, uh, what was it? January 25th, mm -hmm. 2011. Um, and you know, the thing is, 
being born and growing up here all my life, I've always known about these protests that never really led to anything. I never even thought of going to vote because, you know, we had the same president for, like I was born in March 1981, where Anwar Sadat was president at the time. Six months later, he was assassinated, and then Hosni Mubarak was the only president I've known for my entire life, yeah. <laughs> up until the, the revolution in 2011. So, you know, I, no, I never really bothered to think about going to vote, because we always knew it was, well, you know, it was just a, a charade. Mm. Uh, but, but that event, that Facebook event, I, when my student told me about it, and I went back, I opened it, I thought, and I found the number of people who had confirmed attending was over 500,000 people. I never, and I you know never in my life have I seen that num anything anything close to that number on a Facebook event. So, I, so I felt there's something there happening, you know. But you don't know what's going to happen, you know. And all of a sudden, it it be, it kind of uh, was like a snowball effect, you know. Peaceful marches, and then one day led to another. So we had over the course of 18 days. It was because Egypt had just really reached a point where things were really bad. And, and people couldn't take it anymore, and so everybody joined in until after 18 days, he finally stepped down. Um, and I was supposed to go back to Montreal just around this time, but then I, I felt I wanted to stay with my family a bit longer just to make sure everything, everyone's safe, and so I extended until March. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll tell you something, Leah, there, there was, uh, during those 18 days, uh, one of you know, the, the corrupt government at the time, uh, one of their tricks that they tried to uh, distract people from going to protest, they retired the entire police force uh, and they broke open all the prisons and let all the prisoners roam free and they told people to stay home and guard their houses. Mm -hmm. And I found all my neighbors on my street here standing guard and I found a lot of them holding, you know, guns and rifles which is, you know, kind of a scary thing to think of. But honestly, uh, I never felt safer because, I mean, we never, I mean, it's a say, it's, it's always, my neighbor has always been safe, thank God, but uh, people just came together. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's a long road, but, but, that, but, but those 18 days are, are, are a period that those of us who lived it, and I was very grateful that I was here at the time, uh, it's it's a period that I'm never going to forget for the rest of my life. You know, like the the second wave with Mohammed Morsi when uh, when people protested also against him, he didn't last four days. Or Hosni Mubarak was, you know, this was 18 years, 18 days before he stepped down. So, uh, yeah, you wouldn't expect to have two, uh, you know, two two uh, waves of protests, you know, two years apart. But uh, that's what ended up happening. What did it feel like being in that huge crowd, like in terms of the authorities, like you weren't scared for no, your life? No, no. Uh, the, the people, the, the, that's the funny thing, because the, ma the main center of the protest was that there's a very famous square here in Cairo called Tahrir Square. Ironically, Tahrir means liberation, <laughs> but it's been called that for a long time. But the people who were protesting, they were all going there in the thousands and maybe millions, um, but they were checking the idea of everybody going in and they wanted to make sure that you, because uh, as an Egyptian citizen, everybody has, um, you know, the, your profession is written on it. So for me, I always have my profession written as an architectural engineer. So they were checking that nobody's from the police force because ah. at the time the police force was the one to worry about. So mm -hmm. peace, it was a peaceful, peaceful protest and, but it was very well organized. So um, I also, I think I was lucky also because I went, it was uh, February 1st. The very next day, you know, the, the corrupt forces, let's say, they sent people riding on horses and camels to, to kind of attack the protesters. Yeah. So, you know, and yeah, people, people died there and people, you know, got injured. Some people, you know, they lost their eyes and stuff. But I was grateful. I was just lucky that I went through one of those peaceful days, not one of those okay. violent days. So um, it's yeah, <laughs> it just happened the way it is. Yeah, wow. So back to Montreal. So when you started to get to know the Arab um, community there, 
people speak different dialects. Was there ever trouble, any serious troubles communication or just like tiny little things where you couldn't understand each other? It depends on the country. So, you know, for anyone who's, who does not a, who doesn't speak Arabic, I'll, I'll just explain that every country in the Arab world developed their, di developed their dialect from the uh, what is known as the classical Arabic language, which is the richest source. It's somewhere between 50 to 60,000 words. Uh, and each country developed their own dialect from that, the classical Arabic. It's known as Fusha. And Fusha, or classical Arabic, this is the, the, um, the Arabic that you would use to write a formal letter or anyone on the news or if you're reading the papers or any novel. Usually it's written in classical Arabic. Um, I was fortunate enough to have gotten a good education and I have a good you know, command of, of, of classical Arabic or Fusha. So that makes it easier for me to understand dialects of other countries. That being said, some of them are easier for me than others. The thing is also, Egypt is considered like the Hollywood of the Middle East. So everyone from the Arab world grew up watching Egyptian films. Hmm. And Egyptian dialect also is known to be one of the easiest. So, you know, us Egyptians, we pride ourselves of having the most famous dialect. But the thing is, um, what I didn't realize until I moved to Montreal is that I found myself at a disadvantage because everybody else understood my dialect, but not vice versa. So for me, I understand, like some of the easier dialects uh, would be Lebanese, Iraqi, because Iraqi is closer to Fusha also. Lebanese, I'm a bit more familiar with. Syrian, a big part of it is similar to Lebanese, but there's some part of it which is a bit difficult, more difficult for me to understand. Tunisian to a certain extent, but Algerian and Moroccan, forget about it. Mm. Because it has also, with French colonization, there's a strong influence there, and also there's the Berber dialects. Uh, so that was, these two are maybe the, the most difficult for me. So. Sometimes, uh, but, but they're, they're nice enough to also change their dialect to make it closer to Fusha or even to Egyptian dialect when they speak to me, my Moroccan and Algerian friends, you know, and, I'm, and I appreciate the efforts that they make. Uh, they also ask me to talk to them in Egyptian dialect because they love the sound of it so much. But, um, and sometimes, you know, I would have to talk to them in French, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting, but I love it. I love just the idea of being able to talk to somebody who comes from a different country, you know, we speak the same language. Mm -hmm. with small differences. Even, you know, just like in any country, when you go from one city to another, there are differences in dialects. Even in Egypt, from the north of Egypt to the south of Egypt, there's, uh, there are differences. Even from Cairo to Alexandria, which is only like they're three hours apart, the Alexandrian dialect has its own special thing. And, and as someone from Cairo, you would notice that some, this person is from Alexandria because of how they say certain things. You know. mm -hmm. But I, I love that. I'm curious, when you're in Turkey, of course, the language is completely different. But there must be similarities in the culture. And did you, did you feel at home there, or did it feel like in the sense of being familiar, or just that you, you loved it? Yes, absolutely, very much so. The thing also I should mention, technically I'm half Turkish from my mother's side of the family, oh, like okay. just by roots, but I mean not culturally, because the first mm -hmm. time I went to Istanbul or Turkey in my life was just in last April. But um, we've always had this connection. Uh, me, my mother, even though she's Egyptian born and she doesn't speak Turkish, but she has a Turkish name, it's mo mainly her maternal grandparents that are of Turkish Ottoman roots. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, the fascinating thing, it's so similar. It's very... The, the, the thing too, uh, so Egyptian dialect, um, it actually contains a lot of Turkish words. Um, and Turkish language... It used to use Arabic alphabets up until Atatürk changed it to Latin. Mm -hmm. But the language itself contains a mixture of Arabic words, French words, and other, other words. But it's definitely, it's, I still need to work on it. But as far as culturally, I mean, come on, you know, oud, kanun, these are the instruments of all the Arab world. And... and um, even even the the best the, some of the best Arabic calligraphers because Arabic calligraphy is an art form, and some of the best Arabic calligraphers are in Turkey. 
I actually, I have an Arabic calligrapher friend of mine in Montreal who I asked to design this, uh, this writing, which okay. I sent to the Turkish maker. I don't know if you can see that. And he yeah. kind of added uh, ornamentation around it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I was in Turkey, I would have maybe, if I knew a calligrapher there, I would have asked him to make it for me. But, but culturally, it's so similar, for sure. The, even the mosques, the call to prayer, that's the interesting thing for me. Growing, growing up here, um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, the, the, the people who, who chant the call to prayer in a mosque here, unfortunately, they're tone deaf. <laughs> so they, they sound absolutely horrible, out of tune. And all my life, I thought, why does it not sound good where I come? Like, and I, I listen to like a gospel in a church and it sounds lovely. It's not that it doesn't sound good. It's like this person, unfortunately, doesn't have a musically trained ear, but... Mm -hmm. If you go on YouTube and you and you search for a call to prayer, you know there are some great singers from Egypt who are just not everywhere. Yeah. Um, in Turkey, uh, the, the the people who call make the call to prayer. It's called the Adhan. Uh, they sound great. Um, but so the interesting thing for me too is that each call to prayer is sung in one of the main known Arabic modes. Mm -hmm. There's even, I, I saw somebody talking about how each, because there's five per day and each one uses a different mode for a different kind of mood. Um, but overall, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, Turkey is a, is a Muslim culture, uh, nation, just like Egypt is, you know. Um, but uh, even, even if, yes, there was a, language was a bit of a barrier, uh, but... There's people I met there who thought that I've, I've that I've I've been visiting there many times because I was so much at home. Mm -hmm. Even even if language was a barrier, I had no problem whatsoever getting around. You know, just having my mobile phone with Google Map, the Istanbul card, the transport card that I used to take the the trains or the buses everywhere. Um, and you know, some people also told me. Uh, they have some prejudices. Oh, Turkish people are not always nice, or uh, you know, I did not in my 25 days there have one bad interaction with anyone. I also make the effort. You know, I I I, I learned a few basic words. You know, the, the the most basic phrase I would use is "Do you speak English, please?" Which I would say to them in Turkish. Lütfen İngilizce biliyor musunuz? And you know, if they say yes, then that makes life easier. If not, then fine. I'll just. Use Google Translate, but for me, I think it's all about um, trying to uh, shorten the gap. You know, I, yeah. I come to them. Unfortunately, people, you know, they go there. They expect them to talk English. Well, they're not necessarily going to bother. You know, you're the guest. You have to make the effort. But if they see you making the effort, they're going to reciprocate and also try to help. And I've had several interactions with people who, you know, they speak no English. Uh, uh, you know, but it, with Google Translate, it worked. I had a guy f fix the zipper on my suitcase, like the, the handle broke. The entire interaction took 10 minutes through Google Translate. No problem, you know. That's, that's great, yeah. yeah. Um, we, I was curious about percussion because, well, actually, let's talk about your album for a minute. Sure. Um, Ela Mata. So I really love it. I, I think people should go to Bandcamp and check it oh, out. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to it. And the percussion player, Joseph Khoury, I know there's a story when you were making this recording. Yes. Um, Joseph is a wonderful uh, percussionist who plays mainly uh, Middle Eastern percussion instruments, such as the darbuka, the rek, the frame drum. He also plays the Latin instruments as well, such as the congas and the bongos. He's originally Lebanese. Even he went to Istanbul and took some master classes in Darbuka. And so he's a wonderful percussionist. And um, I introduced him to Mike the first time they met, was at my place where we formed this trio that, you know, we ended up working together for the years that followed. And then we're working our album, we recorded my album together. Um, and so the. Um, the recording session that of my album actually it it, it took place over uh, two days uh, in the first week of January in 2018 um, at Piccolo Studio at the far east end of Montreal. Um, it's a wonderful studio. Uh, 
that's where Celine Dion began her career, as far as I know. Uh, the the two brothers who run who work in the place, the, there's Pierre Messier, who was the sound engineer on my album, and his brother Dominique, who plays drums with uh, Celine Dion, as far as I know. Um, and so we recorded, if I think it was January 5th and 6th, just uh, two days in a row. Um, and I took the approach of um, recording live. There was no multi-tracking, kind of... Uh, that's kind of what it felt like the best decision to to approach recording this music because this is how we played it and I wanted to kind of bring that live feel to the recording. Um, so as it happens, most of the songs on my album are recorded with the frame drum. Um, Joseph has his own frame drum, which he bought from one of the Gulf countries here when he was on tour uh, earlier. And the best percussion instruments are known to have natural animal skins. Uh, usually like frame drums are made with goat skin and the books are made with fish skin. So heads has a goat skin. So these, they, ha they produce the most organic sounds. Um, so this is, this is like the best quality you can usually get out of them. The disadvantage is that they are susceptible to changes in temperature and humidity. So if the, if the, humid if the humidity is very low, if it's very dry, uh, then the skin becomes very tense um, and vice versa. If it's very humid, it becomes very loose. So sometimes if it's, if it's too humid, he would have to heat the skin by maybe like with a lighter or placing even like a light bulb behind it. And if it's too loose, you maybe have to apply just a dab of, of like a drop of water on it to kind of moisten it a little bit. My issue with Joseph's frame drum is that it was always too tight for my liking. It didn't produce enough bass sound because look, these percussion instruments, I mean, with the exception of the lick, which has so many different sonic textures, but there, there's like two main sounds. I mean, there's several ones, but the two main ones is called the dum, which basically gives you like the more bassy sound and tech, which is the more treble sound. So his dum, the bass sound, it, it was not bassy enough for me. And um, I asked um, another friend of mine who was a wonderful percussionist who was very active in the Montreal scene. His name is Patrick Graham. And Patrick has several percussion instruments, including a wonderful frame drum that is made by the Cooperman Percussion Company in Vermont, in the States. Uh, and they make them with different diameters. His is a 20 inch diameter frame drum. They're made with a special type of synthetic skin which sounds absolutely beautiful, but the advantage of, of those frame drums is that they're tunable. So you have all these uh, tuning uh, keys that are usually tuned with a, with a hexagonal Allen key. Um, and so Patrick was nice enough to lend us his, uh, his frame drum, which ended up saving my album actually, because what happened during those sessions was the studio being a high tech studio, they have heated flooring. And uh, like they have this huge space where most musicians record in. So they placed me and Mike uh, in these partitions that they kind of formed around each one of us to minimize bleeding. Uh, but Joseph, they placed him in a separate room with like a revolving door, which looks like one of these garage doors, but it has like an open window. That way, you know, he would completely be separate from us. And he has these carpets. So after the first day of recording, he didn't bother putting his instruments back in their cases. He just left them on the, on the carpets and went home. And then we go back the next day to find that his frame drum that he bought from the Middle East, the skin had tore all around the rim of the frame drum because of how dry it was. It, like, it was so tense uh, that, that the skin being pulled already on the rim of the frame drum, uh, it just completely tore. And I ended up getting him a replacement goat skin when I came back here to Cairo in my following trip. But thankfully to, uh, to Patrick's frame drum, that's the, the, the main percussion instrument that was used to record most of the songs on my album. And I liked it so much that I ended up the, uh, getting my own frame drum, the, the exact same one when I was in Montreal the, in the summer of last year, 2021. I got the same one and I brought it with, back with me here. Um, I have it... Right there, I don't know if I should bring it. If you think that it might would be, be awesome, good. yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought it'd be quite interesting for my listeners because I'm um, 
talking with quite a few percussionists and drummers from different backgrounds this season. Okay. So, nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a professional percussionist, but I can say that I can play a beat. Um, and this is by far my favorite percussion instrument. So this is the exact, well, I mean, the exact same model as the frame rub that was used on my album. Um, so it has all these keys that are all around the rim that are allow you to tune it. Um, so I can, you know, if I want to just play a regular beat, I'm just going to just give us a bit of an introduction to the sounds. So this is the doom sound, which I love it. I love just the, the, the projection, the deep end of it, and the overtones. And then there's the... So, you know, something like... So for me, it like kind of takes me to a meditation or a trance, you know. But Joseph, obviously being, that's his forty, he, uh, he played it wonderfully on several songs. The, the title track of my album, El Amata, um, he played a wonderful solo on that instrument. So thankfully that saved my album. <laughs> Well, it, I, I love the album and that title track, and I, I definitely, um, I was just listening to that percussion solo this morning, actually. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. I'm sure Joseph would be very happy to hear that if he tunes in. So a lot of those frame drums have snares, correct? Not this one, but... Some of them do, yes. Um, it's known also in like the more Maghreb, Northern African part, uh, countries like Morocco, uh, Algeria, and Tunisia. And so... Cooperman have designed some of them with the um, the springs in the middle. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can like you know turn them on and off, mm -hmm. and and they they produce like it's a, it's a special sound. Mm -hmm. um, but it it that's not it didn't work for what what I wanted. But I mean I've played some of those and uh, it's you know because it's kind of part of the the traditional music that is played there. I'm not sure if. Um, the springs are in Egypt because <clears throat> also in Egypt, you know, the frame drum is as a as a general instrument. It has different names uh, in, in different parts of the Middle East. So in, in in maybe in Morocco or Tunisia or maybe even the Gulf, it's called the bendir, which has a bigger depth. Mm -hmm. But the frame drum also is uh, an essential instrument in Nubian music. And it's known in that music as the tar. So the Nubian tar also is made out of goatskin, but it doesn't have the, the springs. But uh, Hamza Din that I was talking about earlier, even in one of his later albums, he did this track where he's recording multi-tracking, like kind of um, superimposing several beats over one another with a frame drum. So, and then the more traditional, or the, the maybe the more popular name in more like, Arabic, traditional Arabic music uh, is called the duff or daf as you call it. So you have these different names for it. I find it interesting in terms of um, jazz history because I was researching the origins of the drum set and then, you know, the snare drum which came from Europe, well, where did that come from? So I know, I'm not a music historian or musicologist, but from what I understand that the um, Middle Eastern frame drum then went to mi uh, medieval Europe and I think it was called the tambour, and then evolved into mm. the snare, the military snare drum, which became part of the drum set, Amazing. which is part of the evolution of jazz. So I find all these um, worlds meeting super interesting. Yeah, I mean, jazz also has a lot of its roots coming from Africa initially, right? Oh no, the roots of the yes, of course, but I mean, in terms of the percussion instrument uh, part of it, and and Asia with the you know, and, um, uh, Turkey with this. Uh, symbols and all that so that's uh, yeah. I got into that with Micah Sudri on his episode which will be released before yours okay yeah and and then I'm thinking about the oud um, which evolved into the lute in in Europe and 
all of that. So it's just, it's also connected. Absolutely. And when you went to Montreal and you were exposed to this very rich jazz scene, it must have been really amazing for you. Can you speak to that experience? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I was getting really into jazz music before even moving there, and this is kind of why I moved there. Um, I, I, I was listening to whatever I was exposed to here in Cairo before going there. Um, obviously, it's not the same as when you go to to um, a, like a city like Montreal ha has very important um, contribution historically in the evolution of jazz music, even. Um, and and studying the music, I mean, I did two music de degrees. First one is at Concordia University, and the second one is at McGill University. Uh, so. Uh, you know, over the course of my life in Montreal, I spent six years studying jazz music full time, and I took several I took several courses of history of jazz, and that's what really made me understand how jazz music as an art form uh, evolved over you know the past one hundred years or more. Um, but then, actually living it in in the actual jazz scene of Montreal was uh, also completely a mind blowing experience in the sense that Montreal has a very strong jazz scene um, i mean even before moving to montreal i would um, i had visited montreal three times in the early 2000s and i had been to the montreal jazz fest several times but since i moved there in 2006 um, I all of a sudden found myself uh, being with the privilege of being able to go uh, to attend the concerts of all these heroes of mine that I grew up listening to but never got a chance to to see in concert and some of them I would even go backstage to meet you know so I'm I attended concerts by everyone you know uh, even Dave, like Dave Brubeck I remember I, I got to see him in concert he was 91 at the time so that was incredible so I have like a wall of concert tickets. Most of them are yellow from because uh, they're from Place des Arts. Yeah. But um, it was definitely very um, enriching to say the least. And you know when I went to some of those shows at the jazz bars like upstairs or Diaz Owens or House of Jazz, you know, just being up close and personal, um, it's there's something very special about that as well. And then. You know, the main thing also is that I I, um, I got to meet and get to know all these incredible uh, local Montreal musicians who were actually my music teachers, both at Concordia and McGill, whether they're guitarists, saxophonists, bass players, drummers, pianists, you know, all jazz instruments that you can think of. So going to see them in concert also was very special because... Um, the great musicians and and seeing them play this music at such a high level was very inspiring for me to to want to get better at it. Um, so it was uh, definitely something uh, that contributed a lot, I guess, to my evolution as a musician. Mm -hmm. So I know you do a lot of teaching, especially online now. Is it what is it split like between jazz and oud and clap? Like, what are you teaching mostly these days? Um, it's Anything that my student comes with, <laughs> that's one of the things that I love about teaching. Like you never know like, what a new student wants to do, and each day, each lesson is, you know, completely customized, and tailored around that student. Um, but definitely, I continue. Even yeah, so I was teaching mainly in person up until the beginning of the pandemic, two years ago. That's when I started teaching online. Um, first, I was you know I was posting progress of some of my in-person students online and then suddenly I had friends of mine in Montreal contacting me to take uh, online lessons on Zoom. So I began with that for a while and then I got contacted by this wonderful uh, Chicago-based online music school called Arpeggiato, which is uh, music for all instruments that go pluck. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're a great school. Um, their director, Brander, is a, Brandon Aker, is a wonderful classical guitarist, and um, they added me as their oud player, but because I also am a guitar player, so I teach both. So they brought me students um, 
oud students and guitar students. So I have one wonderful Moroccan oud student who lives in Paris that I teach, and we talk about all these uh, music modes. And you know, Morocco also has its own thing, which is incredible. Uh, there's even a, a, a complex a microtonal system that goes even uh, smaller in intervals than quarter tones. There's like eighth tones. And I, I, I got a bit of introduction into that when I was in Istanbul, but it's very much part of Moroccan, uh, traditional Moroccan music as well. And then I have another student in the States who was working with on jazz standards. So, you know, you keep changing hats from one student to another. Um, and then I have another student who wants to work on a classical piece. So, um, but I love that. I love yeah. you know, working, you know, it's for me, it's always learning experience also as a teacher. Yeah, I was thinking how, you know, the internet has, it can be such a force for good, like in the, the uh, it, revolution we were talking about. And also in terms of musical connections, like there was a guy you met, um, Joseph, uh, that's um, Egyptian Australian. I can't pronounce his last name. Joseph Tawadros. Yes, yes that Tawadros. you knew for years through Facebook, and then finally got to yes. play with him. Yes, he, I mean, I mean, I got introduced to him by a friend of mine here uh, back in 2010. Like that trip when I came here to bring brought my first oud, I was just looking where can I get a good oud because it's not easy to find a good oud, especially here in Egypt. So um, I, I was asking Joseph because he's a fantastic oud player who's done incredible accomplishments and um, ironically he is the one who introduced me to the maker that made this out for me mm -hmm. so the maker his name is Jangi Sarakosh uh, he, he works with his son Vesal so Vesal the son he made what is now like Joseph's signature oud series so they work together um, and so yes Joseph being Egyptian Australian, I mean, he was born in Egypt, but his family took him to Australia when he was two years old. So he grew up there, completely Australian. But he would always come back to Egypt, and he, he's still an Egyptian. You know, he's, a, he's Egyptian Australian. He has both cultures in him. Uh, but whenever one of us came to Egypt, the other was away in his other country. So mm -hmm. you know, if he's here, I'm in Canada. If I'm here, he's in Australia. And but we stayed uh, friends online for 12 years up until two weeks ago. I mean, I'm here in Cairo for most of the year now, and he just messaged me out of the blue. Are you in Egypt? Yes. Are you coming soon? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> you know. So we got to meet up a couple of times. Um, the first time uh, we went on a, on a sailboat with a group of friends and we played music together. And then uh, uh, the second time uh, he played a solo concert at there's the, the famous um, um, Arabic Oud house here in Cairo. Uh, I, I went and attended a, a lovely performance by him. Uh, and now he lives in London, so it's easier for him, and he's going to come back more often. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So I was. There's so much more we could talk about, but I'm mindful of your time, and I'm wondering if to close out this conversation, you'd be willing to play some jazz for us. Sure. Yes. Um, it will be a chance to play my electric guitar. <laughs> Um, this guitar I brought um, second hand from somebody in Montreal and um, it's been my guitar of choice for many years because it's a semi hollow guitar and so it, it kind of it's quite versatile to play different styles of music on it I even um, I, I, I had worked on a, on a cruise ship uh, for uh, almost six months ten years ago and that guitar allowed me to play different styles. So, um, let's see. Uh, I'll play maybe uh, one of my favorite jazz tunes that I like playing a lot on guitar. So this is uh, Naima by John Coltrane.
Gorgeous, Ali. Thank you. You're such a lyrical player. <laughs> Thank you. You're too kind, Mia. Thank you. I'm wondering, just to close out, as a teacher, is what kind of advice do you give your students about practicing music? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, the biggest challenge is always um, pushing ourselves to sit down and practice and making the time for it. You know, everybody wants to learn the song, but it requires time and, and discipline and uh, you know c continuance. You know, it's you learn it. You learn whatever piece of music you're working on. It's not always learned over one practice session. It's building blocks, right? So I just try to encourage them to approach it from a place of love. Uh, first of all, I ask them, what do you want to play? Because I'd like to work with them on playing what they want to play, because that's, I find, what's going to motivate them to sit down and practice. Um, and trying to really um, incorporate that into their daily lifestyle, because, you know, like for me, this is, this is my life, so it's always a challenge also for me to, to always find the time, find enough time. I, I never practice as much as I want to, but I know that this is what has to be done. But not, maybe not everyone is always aware of that. So I talk to them about how to, you know, incorporate it into as a routine part of their daily life, you know. Um, and obviously, depending on whether we're talking about oud or guitar or, you know, what kind of music or... It's obviously important to to develop uh, proper practice uh, techniques and routine because also it's not about how long you practice but but how efficiently you do it. Um, and then uh, you have to, you have to take breaks, you know. So you ha you know it's uh, for me some the way I, it works for me now is that I would practice for maybe like a like a thirty minute session and then I take a, a break just to rest my mind and stretch my body and then I go back again. That, that's more efficient and also doing it regularly or, um, you know try to do it a bit every day even let's say if you don't have all the time that you want but it's more efficient to do a little bit every day rather than not touching your instrument for several days and then just trying to like squeeze in like a three-hour session um, so but you know sometimes some some people like some weeks they have more time, some weeks they have less time. So I always pick up from where we left, where we left off the previous time. Um, but I try to encourage them, you know, because 
the biggest joy for me as a teacher is seeing the progress that they make. Um, and I bring that to their attention because they're not, they wouldn't always necessarily see that. And I'll tell them, hey, you know, just like a few lessons ago, you couldn't do that yet. You know? So just be patient, trust in the process. It's a, it's a lifelong journey. You know, we, we get the sense of accomplishment when we finish that one piece of music, but uh, it never ends. You know, that's the beauty of it. Like you, there's always something to work on. For me, it will take me 10 lifetimes to, to learn everything that I work on, everything that I want to work on. Um, so if you let music be a part of your life, you'll never get bored a day in your life. Um, so just, and, and never forget that we do this for ourselves, you know, because it's something that we love doing. Um, don't pressure yourself for no reason, you know. It, like, you know, the, the progress needs a certain amount of time or, or needs a certain, like a, if it's a phase that you have to go through and you will get there eventually. So you just have to pro trust in the process and be patient and just kind of approach it like, a, like an act of meditation and you'll get there eventually. Yeah. Beautifully expressed, I love that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your um, your generosity with your music and your perspectives today. It was super interesting. Oh, Beautiful. it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun. I, and I, I actually, before this morning, I wanted to say I was uh, starting my day listening to the the one you did with uh, Derek um, Griffer. from Griffer from South Africa, yeah. a wonderful guitar player, and, and I really enjoyed listening to that. So uh, I look forward to listening to the other ones as well. So thank you for uh, making me a part of that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Ali. My pleasure. <laughs> I hope this series inspires you and brings you a feeling of joy and connection with my creative guests. You may be interested in my previous conversations with Hushyar Khayyam and Shariar Jamshidi. I also feature a lot of jazz musicians, so please check out my episode catalog at leahroseman.com. You can find a link to leave me a tip to support this work in the description. Have a great week.